I'm a little bit biased as far as the topic of this panel is, uh, is concerned. Oh, why I'm biased? Uh, yeah, probably because I'm, I'm too old. And uh, the older you become, the more pathetic you are. This is my also um, experience. In particular, when I look at the Professor Noemi Davis, then even more, I, I'm uh, uh, se sentimental. But uh, uh, I read his books, and uh, um, for many, many years, we in Poland <clears throat> used to uh, describe ourselves as uh, solidarity leaders when we were young and dynamic in the late 70s or early 80s. And we had very strong views on the future of, uh, of politics. And we always were convinced that the democracy and market should go hand in hand. That there is no free market model and a riot police. And I even remember when <clears throat> many, many, many years ago, Prime Minister Tusk, how he is called today, but at that time he was uh, recognized as Anna Baric, which is a rather female uh, surname and first name, he asked me to write a paper on reforms in, in Chile. And I was at that time very much under the impression of uh, Chicago School of Economics and the very significant progress they achieved uh, in Chile. However, f and I was lucky, in the concluding uh, sentences, I said, this is an excellent example of uh, successful uh, reforms, but in Poland we would like to have free market and democracy at the same time. So that's why I would like to also to raise the, the topic, which is not that much business driven when the, this famous transatlantic um, partnership is, is considered. But uh, in order to make also your life more complicated, I went into the treaties of, of Rome and, and Treaty of Washington, um, um, the very, very old treaties. And what I found uh, there was actually quite um, encouraging for me because in the Washington Treaty, it said very clearly, and it was said in what, in 1949, that it is stated that it's a community of values committed to the principles of individual liberty, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And also, if we look into the Treaty of Rome, then we find a phrase which is very useful for me also for the purpose of this discussion, I quote, that uh, it is intended to confirm solidarity which binds Europe and the overseas countries. And I think that many, many polls over the last 20 years were ever participated in any discussion. They tried to confirm how successful or maybe the most successful international organization was over those years, the NATO. How uh, we, we support uh, European integration, but we um, would not uh, understand it as a, being a good European is at the same time being a good anti-American. Uh, so that's why to this, uh, the dimension of, of, of business, of trade and investment, uh, I put uh, that uh, additional uh, challenge re re related to the, uh, the shared, shared, shared values. Um, but hopefully um, we have uh, on the panel very diversified uh, uh, panelists, so I can review my uh, uh, comments with the different speakers. So I would like to maybe to, to be uh, very provocative from the outset as we had a short discussion um, before the, the session and turn to uh, Ambassador Plunkett, who is on, on the right. He's ambassador, uh, Canadian ambassador to NATO. And before I hand over to you, let me clearly state, and that would be good, that it's 
transatlantic uh, partnership is not between United States and uh, Europe or, or European Union, but is uh, between the North Ameri America and the EU. So that's why the C Canadian point I is important and must be recognized. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. This is my first time in <coughs> Poland, and it's uh, actually a beautiful city to start my uh, opportunity to see this uh, delightful country. Um, I, uh, I'm glad you, you, uh, you made that last comment, uh, because um, I th often a Canadian has to uh, start a conversation on transatlantic issues by reminding uh, some of the audience that there are actually more than one country on the other side of the Atlantic, and I think my Mexican colleagues uh, sometimes face the same challenge. Um, uh, in the opening comments, there were two or three references to the, uh, the soon-to-be-formally-launched uh, TTIP, the transatlantic negotiations. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's useful um, um, to remind people that uh, we are actually well ahead uh, in, in that regard, and we uh, right now are actually very close to concluding uh, an agreement with the EU, which was uh, launched formally in 2009 uh, on a comprehensive and, uh, economic trade agreement. Um, uh, as, a, as a way of, of anchoring this, uh, our government believes that there is no better job creator or generator of economic growth uh, than freer trade and more open trade. And I think we would agree with you that there is clearly a link between uh, strong economic values and some of the political issues that you, you referred to, uh, to earlier. Uh, and so that, to that end, we are active both in a, in a multilateral context. We support an effective rules-based multilateral trading system, uh, as well as we are currently uh, engaged with negotiations on a bilateral or regional front uh, with some 60 uh, different countries um, uh, the largest negotiation obviously being uh, the, the CETA with the EU, uh, but we are, are also involved with the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I know you have an interest in. Um, just uh, uh, as an aside, um, we, in parallel to the, to the economic negotiations that we have with the, uh, the EU, we are also uh, negotiating a parallel strategic partnership agreement under the leadership of my colleague in the audience, our uh, ambassador here to, to Poland. Uh, and I think this, plus the economic uh, agreement, will show how closely aligned Canada and the European Union are on a wide range of issues. Uh, the SPA, the strategic partnership agreement, will show our common uh, and fundamental values and principles, be it human rights, democracy, uh, rule of law. So we, these are two parallel tracks. And we remind our uh, commission friends that we like to keep them as parallel tracks. Um, but we are very busy uh, in, in pursuing uh, this. Uh, we do believe that, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that these economic activities are important to, to, uh, to, to the world. Uh, in, in terms of our activity in, in Asia, uh, we believe this is constant with our active and ongoing uh, growing presence in the Asia-Pacific market and, and TPP membership uh, right now is, is 658 million people with a GDP of a, almost $21 trillion. Uh, and so uh, we believe this is a fundamental uh, exercise to bridge the Americas and Asia and it has a, a, some strategic issues, and we'd also think that it will help both move on the economic front, but also has some political dimensions uh, to it. We don't, we have never believed that these parallel uh, bilateral regional efforts are, 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 are undercutting our multilateral uh, benchmark. We, uh, we negotiated our original free trade agreement with the United States uh, during the time of the, of the Uruguay round. Uh, and, and as with all of our negotiations, we consult closely with Canadian stakeholders, in our case with provinces, uh, business leaders, civil society, to assess the objectives, uh, both offensive, to identify uh, defensive interests, sensitivities, so that our, our negotiators um, we, uh, are, are as well armed as possible. My, my final comment would be is that while each negotiation has its own characteristics and objectives, 
we approach each of them with, with the same set of values. We don't run and find a different bag of values for, for negotiating with the EU as we do with others. Uh, we, we approach these things, as I said earlier, that open trade uh, is a critical element both for our own uh, well-being, plus we also think it, it, uh, it supports our broader uh, geopolitical and, 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 uh, and, and value uh, objectives. Thank you. Thank you very much. So just for your information, Mr. Ambassador, it was just five minutes, so, so per perfect timing and perfect time uh, uh, management. However, what I would like uh, us to, uh, to memorize, uh, besides many important messages conveyed by Mr. Ambassador, is that the, the, the Canadian authorities uh, actually negotiate a business or trade agreement with the, uh, the EU or, and also with some other countries. But um, in parallel, they discuss a kind of a, a strategic partnership uh, related to those uh, uh, common values um, we, we discussed b b before. So maybe I will uh, uh, turn now to former U.S. ambassador to Poland and uh, ask him to introduce to us uh, uh, your views on, on this topic and also uh, uh, I would could have question, or maybe in the second round I could have a question. All right, so flow is yours, Mr. Ambassador. Panie thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be in uh, uh, Wrocław, uh, and uh, it's great that the tradition of the Wrocław Global <laughs> Forum is continuing, and I know the American Embassy, although I don't speak on its behalf, is very proud to be supporting it, and one of my proudest um, moments is the establishment of the Wrocław Global Forum together with my good friends uh, Fred and Matre and, President, and, uh, and the president uh, of uh, Wrocław. So uh, uh, thank you very much and uh, congratulations to PISM for uh, taking up the challenge so well and putting together such a good uh, uh, program with Fran uh, Burwell. So, um, this is a smart audience uh, and an informed audience, so uh, you don't need to know what I'm about to say. So I'll try to say it briefly. But obviously, uh, economically, this is an, uh, uh, the idea of a TTIP, or whatever one calls it, um, is uh, extremely important and makes a huge amount of sense uh, with just some of the, the obvious uh, trade figures uh, with which many of you are familiar. Um, US-EU merchandise trade totaled $650 billion in 2012. Uh, and uh, together, uh, our economies, the US and EU, account for about half of world GDP. And of course, if we add Canada and Mexico, that number is even larger. It's a third of world uh, trade flows. Um, we have relatively open trade with one another. Uh, but still there are barriers to trades and investments. Uh, tariffs are low on average, but they haven't been eliminated. And, um, and even small uh, reductions of trade barriers could yield significant economic uh, gains. Um, and of course this is even more important in light of the fact that the Doha uh, round is uh, stalled. Um, and of course, there's hope that the, that the regulations that w and standards that we set uh, through the TTIP um, uh, and as well the, the, the Canadian um, EU negotiations will have a big impact, a positive impact on regulations and technical standards in other parts of the world. And of course, I'm thinking in particular third countries like uh, China. <coughs> uh, and you know, I need to say something as well about the, the, the US uh, Poland, the bilateral trade relationship. Um, you know, depending on how you do your bookkeeping and if you, if you uh, take the carve outs for some of the US investments into Poland that go through American uh, subsidiaries based in Europe, the United States is, um, <coughs> by most accounts, the number one uh, 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 FDI investor uh, here. Uh, and that uh, American investments in this part of the world are, are bigger than you think. Uh, the asset base in Central Europe 
uh, the U.S. collective asset, asset base in Poland, in Hungary, and in the Czech Republic is uh, just under $150 billion, uh, which is uh, considerably larger than the corporate asset base of the United States and India, which is about $95 billion. So despite the talk about the BRICS, this is still quite a vibrant place for uh, uh, our two-way trade, uh, and, it's, and it's growing. So uh, then the question becomes, you know, okay, we see the need. So is the United States really committed to it? And I'll just say a few words about that, um, which is um, having been a veteran of many uh, discussions uh, and debates uh, about what goes into a president's state of the union. I can tell you that these things are very bitterly fought and very, very um, uh, carefully scrutinized. And the fact that uh, President Obama in his State of the Union uh, chose to devote some time uh, to this issue and to commit to it was not a casual reference. It's a sign of the fact that uh, he sees this as an important part of his second term agenda, uh, an important part of his legacy, uh, an important part of uh, uh, continuing to strengthen and reinforce uh, the uh, economic recovery that the United States is, uh, uh, is, ex is experiencing. So there is, there is a high level um, uh, American commitment. I see a, a slightly urgent look from uh, our chairman, so I, I'll just make one, one other point so that we can leave as much time as possible. You know, to state the obvious, we know this more now than at any time before. We can't have security without prosperity. And so we, we uh, are all interested, and, um, and, and Marchin made this point in his opening, we, we want to strengthen security. It's one of the pillars of the transatlantic relationship, but so is the strength of our economies. We can't continue to provide the uh, military resources uh, we need uh, if we don't have strong economies at home. And so uh, this it, it, it fundamentally um, is about strengthening uh, transatlantic ties uh, and strengthening uh, the community of values uh, that uh, the Prime Minister uh, referred to. And um, uh, what I would finally say is that the debate in the United States at least has been really restricted to uh, the corporate community, the labor community, the expert community when it comes to uh, this uh, transatlantic trade agreement. And what we need to do is, uh, is set it and embed it in exactly the space that the Prime Minister has done, which is to understand this not, not only as something essential to our economies and making ourselves more competitive, but also uh, as a strong, uh, a tangible indication of the importance we attach to the transatlantic community. Okay. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Ambassador. Um, so, Mr. Prime Minister, Sir. now we have a problem. Uh, because uh, I have been advocate, advocating for closer uh, transatlantic cooperation. Uh, Canadians are <clears throat> rather in favor. Uh, Americans are in favor. We have a long history of um, um, good cooperation. I would dare even to say that it was always good for Europe when <clears throat> the uh, North American partners were involved. But it goes uh, slightly maybe in a different direction than you would like to expect it, or it doesn't matter. So floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Mr. Shakut Aziz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, first of all, let me say I'm delighted to be here. I'm neither European nor, nor, I, nor do I belong to the North Atlantic. But uh, this world today is a globalized world and we are all citizens of the world. So anything which happens in one major part of the world affects everybody. I do uh, represent, in a way, the emerging markets, which, as you know, constitutes a major part of the world's geography, a growing part of the world's population, a growing part of the world's GDP. So no country, no region, 
can operate in isolation. However, my personal view is that bilateral or regional uh, economic cooperation agreements, which includes trade, but could uh, actually include much more, are healthy for everybody. And so long as they open new doors and new avenues of economic growth and cooperation, we all benefit. Let me also, ladies and gentlemen, share with you briefly how the emerging markets are looking at this part of the world. The way we look at the world, the major engines of growth are North America, Europe, emerging markets, and there China has a special status, and the BRICS countries, but these are the three main areas. Today, the world and emerging markets see uh, the European theater with some concern. Is the European Union uh, and the uh, various countries in Europe, they've had a lot of challenges. How will this affect our markets for trade? Because they are our major trading partners in many cases. How will this affect the flow of investments? And how will this affect the growth of the world at large? And I'm not here to preach except to say that there is high level of concern and particularly the need in all, all over the world, but particularly Europe too, is for continued improved structural reforms. No part of the world, whether developed or developing, is immune from structural reforms. And that, from our perspective, from the emerging markets, we see that more needs to be done. Having said that now, uh, let me say that uh, we look to the developed world as a source traditionally for aid, investment, and trade. But the good news is, if you ask the people in the emerging world now, they are looking for investment and trade. Aid has gone to number three and reducing in importance, which is healthy. I think that's a good mindset we have to live with. So uh, the other area on trade, since we've talked about it, countries in the world, in our part of the world, are very concerned about the fate of the Doha round. The failure of the Doha round has left a real degree of uncertainty because, as I said earlier, trade will be a major driver for growth in our part of the world. And this important effort of dialogue, which has been going on for so long, has not really produced results. Secondly, investments. When we talk of trade, investment comes with it because if you look at it holistically, countries in the developing world will not grow. They don't have enough savings to grow unless they get investments from overseas. And that's why if Europe and North America do well, we benefit. If they don't do well, we suffer. So in conclusion, our destiny is all linked together. And what policies take place here and in North America affect us directly. As such, we are important stakeholders, and that's why I'm very pleased and happy that I can be here and be a voice for the emerging markets. I'm also a citizen of the world, so I could express views on other things too. Thank you very much for inviting me, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, I'm tempted to turn to the next uh, panelist uh, as to somebody who uh, <clears throat> represents the French business, but that probably would be an exaggeration uh, so I would like to introduce uh, the CEO of uh, one of the largest Polish company, uh, Mr. Vitutski, uh, as a CEO of the Polish company, Thank you. to make um, your life uh, a little bit better. However, if you are uh, ready to make any comment to l'exception culturelle, as the French uh, officials already put forward that this is a precondition on any transatlantic uh, ag agreement, I would be, of course, uh, more, more, more than happy. But it's, it's not a must. Thank you. It's just a small... Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. So, so yes, maybe I will, I will stick to the 49.9% .9 of my spread shareholding, which is not French. Uh, so, so what I like in this, what I like in this, in this panel is that we do link the markets and the, and the values. Uh, until now, we have been for years speaking about markets, trade, 
uh, economies grow. Nothing wrong with this. I'm from the business, so I, I, I will not criticize it as, as there are two visions of the past years. One, which is uh, this open markets have been bringing jobs out of the West uh, to, the, uh, to the developing countries. But, but at the same time, when you look on the value side, means the global, the global economy brought one billion people out of the extreme poverty. So, so we may treat this, this approach of the globalism as, as an human, mathematical, purely business oriented, but, but willing or not, we, 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 we add great value to the, uh, to the world by helping those, uh, convert, uh, those growing economies, those, those new markets uh, to develop and by helping people to find jobs, which is, which is critical. Uh, so now we have, uh, we have this new value, with this new element of, of value, and, and, and I like it. It's, it's mean, it means that we are going at the, at the next level. I don't believe that the, the perfect alignment of the values is, is, is necessary, I, I'm afraid. As today we do a great business uh, with China despite of the Tiananmen. And we do great businesses with other countries despite of the... Um, uh, of the fact that the, they, they do not share all the values. So I, I really believe that the perfect alignment, and it's proven today, uh, it's, not a necessary, it's not a necessary condition. Uh, by the way, I think that those, uh, with all respect to our conference and our meeting, uh, I think that many of the dictatorships, and it was to some extent proven in Poland as well, uh, are much easier to be corrupted by the importation of Coca-Cola, uh, iPad, uh, and the internet uh, than by any conferences or, or, or diplomatic actions. So, so I think that the, 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 the market may spread values simply by, uh, by corrupting, in the brackets, uh, different, uh, different, different dictatorships. So those values, not necessary to the business and not necessary to the global business. The perfect alignment, we don't need it. We, we, we do deal with, with countries not sharing our values. Uh, by the way, the values are sometimes being abused. And a good example is the intra-Europe discussions. The famous, uh, uh, um, the famous expression of the, of the social dumping, which is, which is uh, used as a, as, a, as a value, while it's simply hiding a lack of competitiveness of some European countries towards the other European countries like Poland. Uh, so uh, you use the name of the value, the social dumping, as as a, as a norm in the um, in, in the competitive in the competitive world. So number one, values are not necessarily aligned, and we still can survive. We still can do business. Now I believe the discussion of uh, of values uh, are very much important uh, for us in the in the North Atlantic uh, in the North Atlantic area, because if we have too many diverging or deteriorating or not aligned values, including in, in the business, it may threat our economies, our societies, and our security. Uh, and that's why I think those discussions are, are, are very important. That's why we need the free trade somehow first to support our wealth. If we does, do not support the wealth and the growth in the North Atlantic area, we open the gate to destruction of our values. We open the gate to the populism, we open the gate to the isolation of, of, uh, of, of the different, uh, on the different zones, so this, this temptation of the isolation, those could be the results of not doing this deal, of not going into the growing and, and uh, uh, marketplace. So this is, I think that we, we need the economy for the values. I'm sometimes, I never thought the proper translation into English of my preferred, only preferred statement by Marx saying that the level of our conscience is proportional to the level of our existence. And I really believe on it. If we have a prolongated period of economical crisis, slowdown or even deterioration, this is, this is creating an enormous threat to our Western uh, uh, values world. So, so we need this, this deal, we need the growth of our marketplace uh, to protect the our common, our common uh, uh, value. So we have to do the, uh, uh, the business with the countries, and we do the business with the countries with the other sets of values, but I think that effectively joining this common North Atlantic marketplace and, and redefining, rediscussing, and underlying our common values, it, it, it helps to keep us united, which we may need, with all the opening to the, 
uh, to the external world. Then, as a businessman and, and a citizen, obviously, I, I welcome those discussions because uh, I, I love the idea of, of having European cars with American prices. This is clear. At the same time, I would love to have uh, the European uh, companies uh, participating in the public tenders in the United States. I don't know if you know the number, the, the ratio between the foreigners uh, which are being accepted for the public tenders in Europe as a whole compared to the same value in dollars of foreigners accepted to the public tenders in the United States is 1 to 10. So it's a big element from both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, uh, with Canada, with uh, Mexico. I mean, this is a, a great element of, of increasing uh, the, the, uh, the economies, of creating jobs. Today there is a number of two million jobs to be created with this, uh, uh, with, uh, with this deal. Uh, and, and, and giving, again, oxygen, breathe to our societies, which, which are today tired by the crisis. And we see it in Poland as well. People are tired, so people are open to the destruction of some fundamental values of, of, our, of our zone. Now, can it, can it, can it happen? I, I believe so. I, I believe that it will be quite easy on the traditional 20th century economies, even on the food, so cars, obviously, but even the food, which is a traditional, which is when, when we speak about French exception, but on the other side, in America is the same, same stuff. So the subsidies, we can solve it. It will be effectively much more difficult on the in the 21st century industries, so the intellectual property, uh, yeah. the, the virtual world here, obviously it, 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 will be, it will be tough, but I'm a big partisan of closing and putting on the operations the, the areas we can close as soon as possible and then not waiting with all the deal uh, to be done. Now, to, to finish, what are, my, what are my fears about the, 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 the today's discussions? Uh, number one is again that we are in the period of the crisis, so the populist arguments are heard, heard much more than f 10 years ago. And, and this is the, from both sides of the, of the Atlantic. And the second element, but this is a proper to, this is proper to, to, uh, uh, to, the, to, to all the transatlantic relations, that we don't have enough of the United uh, Europe. When, when I see the, the Secretary Kerry uh, landing in Brussels, I see him on the Polish TV, and the, the message is Secretary Kerry landed in Brussels to discuss free trade agreement. And I, I haven't seen uh, Secretary XYZ from Europe to discuss with him. He probably met with 27 gentlemen, with some head of staff, and with some assistants behind. So this is my second fear, but yeah. like the junction between business and values. Okay, thank you. <coughs> thank you, uh, Chairman Vitutski. Uh, uh, Ambassador Plunkett, uh, do you have any uh, stumbling uh, block uh, regarding those um, negotiations like, like the French? Uh, do you have uh, your own uh, l'exception, I don't know, culturel or I don't know, uh, any other? Or you simply want to, to close the, 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 this deal and, and and from your perspective, is is possible to relatively close it down uh, shortly? Um, I was heavily involved with the the launching of the uh, of the uh, the CETA, the uh, Canada EU negotiations. We did a joint study with the Commission beforehand, in which we had identified that there would be significant gains for both parties: 20% boost in bilateral trade, 12 billion increase in in, in Canada's GDP, at least. So there is real value for both sides. Uh, Europe is sitting here at 12.2% 12, 12 official unemployment, and it's going up. Uh, uh, you, have, uh, you still have uh, what by any standard would be calling an economic crisis. So Europe needs growth. And so these sort of agreements with us, with the US and others, uh, I think uh, is an important uh, step towards bringing the European recovery uh, back and, and with it. Uh, as we're seeing, as was mentioned by an earlier speaker, uh, you're seeing uh, increases in populism and some of the, 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 the sort of the, the darker side of society is starting to reappear. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, this, is, uh, uh, this, this reinforces the importance of getting the economic uh, situation in Europe back on, an even, uh, on a positive footing as quickly as possible. When we look, if you look at the economic study that we did, uh, it identified pretty well the issues that we are struggling to find the conclusion on. 
Uh, I would hate to disagree with you, but some of the traditional issues do still cause problems. Agriculture uh, is, is, uh, is, is one which we are still struggling with. Uh, issues that are out there include some of the ones that are, have been identified, intellectual property, uh, there's some procurement issues, uh, some regulatory questions uh, uh, here and there. We don't have the same cultural problem as that our U.S. friends do because if you look at some of our own agreements, uh, we've put our own exception uh, on the table very quickly uh, with some partners. So in, in that sense, uh, we are more on, an equal foot, uh, on a like footing uh, with the EU uh, in, in this particular area. Uh, and so I haven't seen the final, well, final the, the, the wording, uh, but I, I have not heard in the last few months that this is a, is a problem. So I assume uh, we're not having the same issue uh, that, uh, that our U.S. friends are facing uh, uh, looking forward to the Foreign Affairs Committee meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister Aziz, so I can't identify any problem so far. <laughs> and we have been discussing already 36 minutes. Uh, every, uh, everything looks uh, optimistic. Uh, so let me give you an example of uh, maybe of concern of the others. A uh, few weeks ago, I attended a conference in uh, Istanbul. Um, and on the panel, there were Turkish, Indonesian, and, uh, and uh, Indian speakers, panelists. And all of them didn't like at all any kind of a transatlantic uh, uh, partnership or uh, trans-Pacific partnership because they consider it as a kind of a bilateral agreement and they were very much in favor of multilateral agreement and they were very much in favor of uh, new Doha uh, talks and they were very much in favor of G20 and the Indian uh, guy uh, very strongly spoke in, uh, on behalf of G20 as the most important uh, institution of the new uh, world order, and he was concerned. And you, Prime Minister, you are not concerned, so... No, I didn't say I'm not concerned, but may I respond? Yes, please. <laughs> First of all, uh, the Doha round, or the whole trade talks, uh, is the only global forum to get these issues on the table. I would still say that that does not conflict with bilateral or regional trade arrangements. That's my personal view. Uh, I know many people have different views, but my view is that so long as you open the doors of trade, everybody benefits, no matter how you do it. But Doha round, I don't want to say why it happened, why it got stalled, but some of the people in that room were perhaps there, and they should be asked why it stalled. So I don't think you have one side to blame. You, asked, you said earlier that we haven't identified any of the problems. Well, let me just try to attempt to discuss that, if you allow me. Yes, please. Yeah, I think if you, and I'm just pulling back, not just to uh, Europe uh, or uh, bilateral issues with the United, North America, but globally. I think one of the real issues we are facing today Obviously, one is on the global economy, but uh, we, uh, if you had to ask me to rank the issues, the number one issue on my list is leadership. I would very humbly submit that the leadership we have addressing these issues, I will not name any region, country, or person, does not come up to the level which is required, because what we have and we've always had this, but what we have and are victim of today is that we are short of leaders. Leaders, ladies and gentlemen, worry about the next election, uh, next generation. Politicians, we have plenty, they worry about the next election. Therein lies our problem. When you're taking tough decisions, you need more leaders to rise above short-term gains. And so that's one reason. Secondly, I would say that uh, on uh, economic cooperation, we have to recognize that the current challenges Europe is facing has affected the whole world. And in these challenges, one of the key factors which 
is still being addressed in my view at least, is that when the European countries came together, one of the key ingredients of coming together is, and you cede power to Brussels, countries were not mentally prepared for that. So there was a conflict in their minds. I think that is still an issue that ceding sovereignty, you're actually giving up part of your country's sovereignty to a multilateral organization in Brussels. I have nothing against the EU or Brussels, but this is a fact of life. That people haven't fully uh, flushed out in their brains and uh, in their thinking. So till that happens, you will have this conflict. Now sometimes crisis creates these opportunities. So the Euro crisis and the economic crisis in Europe forced everybody to expand the mandate of the European Central Bank. It was also pretty clear that you cannot run a community of Europe as one economic bloc with just a common monetary policy or a common currency <coughs> and everything else being independent. It is at minimum interdependent, but really it's more dependent. So there's some recrafting, retooling, redesign of what Europe has conceived and Europe where it is today and Europe where it will be tomorrow. This has nothing to do with cooperation with uh, North America or Asia or whatever. So there are in local structural issues within the European community which have to be addressed, which I think is critical for the world because if Europe addresses it, showing the right leadership and uh, the whole sense of getting things done, that will affect the whole world. So we sitting in the developing world, the emerging world, want the European community and the European Union to work seamlessly and to work as one block and become an engine of growth. But at the moment, if I'm getting up uh, anywhere in the Far East or Asia or Mid Middle East or whatever, Africa, Latin America, which is the developing world, I worry every day I open and I see, my God, what's happening? Then you look at the currency. That also has depreciated, so that keeps psychologically affects the image of Europe around the world. Thirdly, there's Europe and there's a, another Europe. It, it, there is still somebody joins with no currency arrangement, somebody joins with some other exception. I mean, let's, sorry, I'm being frank. <laughs> you probably won't invite me again, but that's okay. <laughs> but I want to be frank. So you cannot have these adjustments. It doesn't suit me, so I'm out. It doesn't suit me, so I'm in. Treaties, you, when you uh, come back to leadership, when you agree to come together, the sign of leadership is to give up some sovereignty for the greater good of the whole community. That has not happened in Europe. And that is, to me, the crux of the problem. So I can go on and on, but this is really the issue. So everybody has to show leadership. Now, uh, looking at Europe as we do, this is a major source of investment for us. This is a major source of trade for us. And a major source of technology and systems and processes come from Europe to the developing world. So you have a lot going for yourselves. But I think these internal problems of how the European community will finally manifest itself and whether the man in the street in Europe is willing to give up a right to Brussels. And then in Brussels alone, who's in charge? There's a head of the council, there's a head of the uh, union, there's a president. I, I mean, I, I've, when I was in office, I went there many times. And believe me, it was always an education process because I, I wasn't sure if I'm talking to the right person and what their mandate is. And, you know, this is, I'm giving you the honest truth. Now, maybe it was part of my own lack of knowledge. But I think if this becomes more seamless and it's clear that in Europe, if you join, everybody wears the same uniform, they think the same way, they do the same thing. There can't be category A, B, or C. That's one critical thing for any union. And then secondly, clarity of uh, chain of command, clarity of decision making, and uh, uh, the ability to execute what you decide seamlessly and without reservations has to be there. Otherwise, it will be, you know, two steps forward, one step backward. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a strong speech uh, against the <laughs> slogan, one size fits all, I understand. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, Ambassador. Uh, These are all I, my personal views. That, that's perfect. Uh, you are very, very welcome with your views. Uh, Ambassador, uh, 
I wouldn't like to sh surprise you, but uh, or take you by surprise. But uh, when we look at the transatlantic uh, agreement uh, or partnership, at the same time you look also at the Trans-Pacific Agreement, and I wonder if you could uh, compare it because I couldn't find any good figures indicating what is the importance for the from the Washington perspective of transatlantic vis-à-vis uh, Trans-Pacific. If we have any uh, numbers of, uh, on, on that. So um, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think the way that, um, uh, you know, the United States thinks about this is um, that, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the countries that are participating in the Trans-Pacific Agreement are, uh, you know, are, are, are limited. So it's, it's, a, it's a different uh, kind of agreement than, in some respects, the agreement we're talking about uh, with uh, Europe. Uh, and there are some similarities in that there is this sort of community of values you're talking about in terms of how we're approaching the Trans-Pacific uh, Agreement as well as the uh, Transatlantic uh, Agreement. Um, and I I would say two things that are slightly in tension. First of all, um, it's natural, particularly from this part of the world, that there would be this sort of sense of competition and where uh, the priority lies. But of course, uh, it's natural that the United States would be pursuing both of these things yes. at the same time. And, uh, and, and, th and that um, really um, shouldn't be at all uh, surprising. And I guess what I would say in this context, and to pick up on, on uh, what the foreign minister said as well, um, so, and a little bit what, uh, what um, Maciej Vitutsky said, uh, President Obama's um, you know, famous um, campaign theme was, yes, we can. And you t talked about some of the risks. And I think that this is a genuine risk for us uh, with respect to the transatlantic trade agreement is whether we will because um, the, um, uh, the American economy is doing a little bit better right now. So there's sort of maybe arguably the economic uh, impetus for, for going forward in, in the public's mind uh, could be uh, less strong. Uh, maybe that's less true uh, in, in Europe. But I think it's, uh, it's really quite essential uh, that we, we try to make this work. And as, as, um, as uh, my uh, counterpart, uh, our, our, the Canadian ambassador to the EU said, um, you know, we still do have these traditional issues. And um, unless we're able to elevate the debate and make this a debate, uh, a, a negotiation, about, and this goes to your point, I think, strengthening transatlantic ties, it's very easy to imagine how some of these smaller issues become sufficient to sink the larger enterprise, which is to get an agreement which will, which will uh, continue to uh, bind us together uh, in, in this century. Okay, thank you. Quick, uh, quick question, and then I turn to the audience. Yep. Uh, but it's a difficult question. Because, uh, Still take it. You, you, sh you spoke in favor of this transatlantic uh, uh, agreement, but um, uh, a year ago, there was thousands of thousands of Poles uh, protesting against the uh, ACTA, um, and it was visible that, yeah, young generation do doesn't like that. Uh, kind of uh, agreement on counterfeiting. And so, so how could we, could we, from the Polish perspective, match it? Yeah. Uh, a bigger picture with the, uh, for example, not uh, l'exception culturelle, but l'exception, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, property rights agreement or yeah. something like yeah. that. Well, in this very case, it was a kind of, uh, if I may say, a piratry exception, because we are the country where the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, download of the not necessarily uh, licensed uh, videos and other contents is the most developed in the region. But, but, but again, we post, we are very pragmatic. So if 
we Poles, we know, and we are being informed. So last year it was more for me about uncontrolled populistic explosion. If somebody, that's why we need the leadership to explain to us, guys, this is about two million jobs. This is about the cheaper cars. And this is about our Polish products being exported more easily to Canada uh, and, and, and the US. Otherwise, if we don't have this, this global vision of what is the, 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 the real deal, the global deal, we will have people taking cherry picking the, the, the bad things or, or, or some good things and saying, oh, you cannot be, uh, you will not be possible, you will not be allowed anymore to download the film of Spielberg before he even thought about it, which is the case in Poland. You can have find uh, the newest film before it was even produced by Spielberg. So, uh, so, so, so I believe it was an, an, ex, an, an excellent example of not informed and not l led by a leader uh, opinion. Okay, so we have a problem with the leadership in Poland. I think I have to leave now because <laughs> it's getting too dangerous for, for me. Uh.